Awesome. I'm Colleen Cosmo Murphy, founder of Classic Album Sundays, and welcome to another one of our collaborative events with the British Library. At our worldwide events and on our Classic Album Sundays website, we tell the stories behind our favorite classic albums, revealing a better understanding of the artist's intention behind the music so that fans can approach the album with enhanced context, a new framework that inspires a fresh approach when listening to an album they may have heard hundreds of times before. At our live in-person events, we follow the interview with a replay of the album on our own world-class audiophile sound system so that listeners can fully immerse themselves into the music and hear details they've never heard before. Well, we can't do that today. So instead, I encourage you to take a moment for yourself after this interview and listen to the entire featured album uninterrupted on whichever format available to you, following our classic album Sunday's guidelines. Turn off your phone, turn down the lights, refrain from conversation, turn up the volume, kick back, and give yourself over to the music. Today, I'm speaking with an artist whose creativity is expressed in myriad disciplines, sculpture, visual artist. She's a performer, filmmaker, poet, philosopher, an electronic pioneer, an inventor, and a composer, vocalist, and musician who has released albums for the past four decades, Lori Anderson. We're going to talk to her about her 1986 soundtrack to the concert movie of the same name, Home of the Brave taking a look at the story behind the album, but also reappraising it with a fresh perspective and looking at its relevance today. Hi, Lori. Thank Hi. you so much for joining us. Hi, Colleen. It's great to be here. Oh, thank you. Now, you're a prolific artist who seems to always be creating. And in the 80s, you produced a few studio albums and live albums, Big Science, Mr. Heartbreak, the United States Live Box Set, Home of the Brave soundtrack and Strange Angels. So a good jumping off point is the story of how Home of the Brave came about. Why did you decide to put together a stage concert film with an accompanying soundtrack? And how did it draw upon your previous recordings? I was just talking about that with my co-producer, Roma Baron last night, and neither one of us can remember why. It was so <laughs> long ago. I, I, we, um, we just liked being in the studio. And so we were looking for stuff to do. I, I guess that's the reason. I mean, what is the reason you do anything? So um, I, um, I in live shows, used a lot of visuals. So I thought, you know, just for once, I'll try to make a film with the music at the same time. So that was the, <clears throat> the, the reason for doing the concert film. And then after we did that, we thought there was so much music generated in that let's make another record so we, we can't remember exactly how that happened but it was roughly like that and then didn't you tour to promote the concert film as well so didn't you have a, a natural history tour afterwards yeah i mean they they were all sort of mixed into one long thing that just had kind of random names attached to them mm -hmm. <clears throat> just whatever i was doing at the time i wish i you know like painters can do this. They can just call their next show recent work, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> musicians can never do that. They have to come up with a label for each thing they're doing. So this is all just, was all recent work. There was just one long thing. Now, really. why the title Home of the Brave? And for the viewers watching who are not aware of this phrase, it is part of our United States national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. There's a phrase, Home of the Brave. Why did you use this as the title? Well, I had used um, uh, lots of uh, U.S. slogans and works, and one of my subjects is uh, portraits of the United States. I did a long eight-hour <clears throat> series of things called the United States, parts one through four. Uh, just, and you know, really why I started doing that was um, I was basically an expat. You know, I, uh, in the late 70s, a lot of us didn't have so many opportunities to work in the United States. We had more opportunities to work, particularly in Germany and Italy. Those are the places that we went. And so we'd be sitting around after doing a concert, usually like in an art gallery, it was kind of that sort of thing. And people would go, how could you live 
in a country like the United States. I mean, that, that just like, uh, how, how do you manage that? And, and I, and I, you know, the answer was a very long one and it turned out to be an eight hour answer. So, um, many of the, um, subjects of, of my songs have been, uh, what it's like to be, uh, an American. I'm, I got the, the pin on, the pin is back on after, <laughs> after four years. I actually I never wore a pin before, uh, but, uh, I thought I'd wear a pin today. <clears throat> I just wanted to mention too, that, uh, something that I just realized, um, our new administration is uh, uh, kind of in high gear right now. <clears throat> One of the things that didn't get mentioned so so much during the, or at all during the elections was our vice president Kamala Davy Harris. Um, her name uh, means in Hindi uh, Kamala is Lotus, and Davy her middle name is Goddess. So now that she is presides over the U.S. Senate. Her official name is Madam Lotus Goddess. So, I love that. You need to do a song yeah, about that, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now officially uh, she's Lotus Vice POTUS. And I think, you know, if she ever does rise to the top, <clears throat> it would just be Lotus. <laughs> I would like to have someone, I would be very happy to be part of a country led by Lotus. That's my hope. I do have a lot more hope for, for this place now. Home of the Brave was, it had a lot of cynicism and irony in it because that's often how uh, many of us felt at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, you know, the Reagan era really dug its, you know, uh, claws into the country and there were a lot of things going on. Um, Ah, here's a New York siren for you in the background. I miss that sound. <laughs> oh, well, you know, now with the virus coming back um, uh, with more force, uh, I'm very nervous about it. So we're trying to be as safe as possible, you know. Absolutely. Well, this past but, inauguration last week it was a much happier inauguration. I know in 1981, you had an anti-inauguration party when when uh, Ronald Reagan took the oath. Um, but to, yeah. are, are you feeling a lot more positive? Seems like you're feeling a lot more positive right now. Um, I'm always a skeptic. So uh, I'm not like, it's going to be very hard here because this is a very deeply divided country as we just saw. So uh, I'm not, um, but uh, given the choice between being um, pessimistic and optimistic, <clears throat> I'd rather, <clears throat> I guess, just be a, um, a naive optimist. Uh, For so, a change, yeah. feels good. <laughs> Back to Home of the Brave. Are there any songs in particular here? I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, of Sharky's Night. Are there particular songs on Home of the Brave that helped paint your portrait of America at that time? Um, probably Sharky's Night, although when I listened to this record and I did sit down and listen to it full volume and I, wow, I thought the bass is great. Mm -hmm. the, it's got a, it's got a really punchy, especially the low end of smoke rings. It's a boom, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Sharky's Night, it was a little hard to understand the words. I was using a filter that was, uh, uh, I didn't realize at the time was so kind of hard to understand the lyrics. So, um, there were a lot, of, there were some things that I would redo. Um, but that, uh, was, um, uh, Sharky's night was a, a bit of a, a dark thing. And I guess really it is, um, dedicated to, uh, uh, William Burroughs mm -hmm. because he, uh, was such an amazing poet who kind of showed up in the fifties <clears throat> in the United States when everyone was kind of like, uh, here he is over here. Yeah. <laughs> Bill. Um, everyone's just like mowing their lawn and trying to make everything like really average and perfect and, and blank. And he came in and he was like, it's uncle Bill, you know, like everybody, <laughs> Uncle Bill Hyde, he's here, you know. So 
he showed up and he was just saying things that people had never heard before. Um, and they were dark and they were also hilarious. I mean, I, I'm a huge Burroughs fan because, uh, well, um, he made me laugh, you know, and, um, uh, and that's, he's just irresistible that way. So, did yeah. Did you first meet him at the Nova convention in 1978 or did you, had you known him I'd before seen personally? him around, I'd seen him around and, um, but when we met at the Nova convention, uh, I was using that voice and I think it, just cause it was dark and backstage, um, I was sitting on a, on a desk, I guess, and wearing a tuxedo and, um, uh, and I had been talking like that. And so he came up from behind me and, and it's going, uh, uh, so what, what's your name? And I, and I, after three or four lines into this conversation, I realized he's hitting on me. Oh my God, he thinks I'm a boy. And so I was like, I'm not a boy. And I, I didn't want to embarrass him obviously, but, uh, he, he, he laughed at that actually, fortunately. So, um, we became friends. We, we, uh, toured together. I mean, I, I loved him, but also, you know, I had two difficult things with, with Bill. I mean, he, he didn't like women really, which is, was a downside for me. <laughs> just, yeah. Just personally, but you know, didn't like women. That's half the people. Um, and he liked guns. Mm. So he would go out uh, when we were uh, in touring and I'd be sitting in the green room. He'd be out in, in the back, you know, uh, doing target practice. So, yeah. Well, anyway. interesting man, nonetheless, and he certainly revolutionized so many different types of, you know, creative disciplines, even music, yeah. his cut up method kind of being, you know, uh, forecasting music sampling in a sense. Yeah. Now, William S. Burroughs narrated the first Sharky's Night, which came out on Mr. Heartbreak. But on this version, on Home of the Brave, it's a, it's a different version of Sharky's Night uh, with different lyrics that that you narrate. Um, first of all, who is Sharky? You know, um, it, it's, um, uh, I started trying to find names for, for people in songs, uh, and, and then people would say, is that based on anyone? I would just, you know, that's a character in a song. So, uh, uh. I, I just, it, it really came out of, you know, being sick of, uh, myself and, um, and I guess, uh, um, uh, always looking for ways to, uh, be someone else. And so for example, now that I can do that in video form, I can just, um, invoke somebody like Dogen, a 13th century Japanese Zen uh, philosopher who wrote a beautiful book called Enlightenment Unfolds. And the basic question of this uh, text is, are mountains aware? What in nature is aware and what has no awareness? So it was, um, also, hang on. It was also a question uh, in, uh, as I noticed in uh, uh, Home of the Brave, this sort of uh, um, mix of of dreams and consciousness, and and uh, in songs like White Lily, and I had forgotten that that th those um, kind of uh, ideas were were kind of winding their way through at that point. So I was kind of surprised to hear that. Yeah, uh, I, I would love to, to talk about the, 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 your, the dream work that really inspires a lot of your work as well in, in a minute. Um, but but Sharky is, just has a hold on me, those big white teeth. <laughs> and <laughs> I was just wondering if, if is Sharky someone who's kind of might have a more conservative approach to life who maybe sort of oversimplifies things. Is it, is it in a 
someone you're playing devil's advocate with? When I first invented that voice, and it was a digital low voice, I called it the voice of authority, just because it was fun to, it was fun to poke fun at, at um, pompous tech people, you know, who <laughs> <laughs> you can see plenty of them around now too, who's like, oh, I'm technology. And mm. so I've got the future under my thumbs, you know, and you're like, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes about technology is um, that uh, if you think technology is going to solve your problems, uh, you don't understand technology and you don't understand your problems. <laughs> I think that it was, it was just pushing on that, you know, pomposity. And then later this uh, became uh, a voice that was much different and much more uh, melancholy and, and abstract. And, and I, I loved writing this and, um, my husband, Lou Reed, also was very interested in that voice, and he came up with a name for him. He called him Fenway, uh, like the ballpark. And he he would sit around while I was like writing Fenway talks, which was the Fenway was the was the descendant really of the voice of authority. And he um, he liked uh, this character a lot. Lou was. Uh, most of the, his songs were uh, about um, people with names, you know, mm. uh, and they they were Shakespearean in a way. <laughs> they were just like all of these great stories about about um, characters, and so uh, that was my another thing that I was interested in when I listened to this record. I completely have forgot about it. That was a, an influence of Lou was the uh, and uh, it's really corny, but the the girls the girl chorus in Smoke Rings, and oh. and I I didn't know Lou then, but they're they're singing do 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 you know not you know a, another version of it, but um, uh, I'm sure that was in the back of my mind, and it never hadn't occurred to me at all um, before um, listening this time. So it was a really different uh, to to hear that. This was done in 86 and I, I met Lou in 91. Mm, and, that's and, so interesting. Uh, yeah, I had a very sketchy idea who he was too. I thought he was British. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm not proud to say that, but um, I was in a different musical world, mm. you know, and uh, I, I just, there were so many worlds revolving around each other at that time, the fashion world, the music world, the avant-garde world, the experimental world, the rock world, the pop world, the all these worlds, worlds, we call them in New York, they're just scenes, you know, <laughs> we're yeah. so pompous, you know, the financial world. <laughs> you know, it's just Wall Street down there, there's a bunch of guys. With big... The whole world's in New York, though, isn't it, Lauren? <laughs> it's the world, sorry to say, everything else is just like, you know, satellites. Um, so, um, Anyway, uh, uh, I think that that was, that I was probably thinking about that because that was a song that I kind of knew. Well, it's interesting that, you know, you have these, a character like Sharky and I can see the storytelling is such a big part of your work, no matter which discipline or format that you're working in. But from what I understand, you grew up in a big family. Um, and your siblings and parents would tell, share stories with one another around the dinner table. That sounds a lot nicer than it was. <laughs> <laughs> was it more arguing? No, it wasn't arguing. It was posturing. It was like, what did you do today that was any good at all? <laughs> you know, that was notable. What did you achieve? It was, it was really about achievement. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was, um, uh, and it was also the kind of place where it was like, if you don't have anything good to say, you can leave. Mm. So it was, uh, it was a very, um, let's say, um, yeah, a achievement oriented, <laughs> exhausting exercise every night. Wow. Well, it seems like it must have motivated you in some way. 
Uh, I, I, there were many positive things I got out of that. Um, um, my mother, who uh, would say goodbye to me in the morning as a as a kid, she wouldn't say goodbye. She'd go win. I was like, win, win what? What are you talking about? On the other hand, she loved books, and she taught me how to uh, read in ways that I uh, had never imagined. So. Um, she was a great teacher, so I, I, I'd have to say I, I, I'm grateful to all of them. Well, you talk about reading, and I can see language is also a big part of your of your work. Of course, there's the, there's the William Burroughs quote: "Language is a virus from outer space." You have a song called "Language is a Virus" on this album, which is fantastic and so funky as well. Um, why this fascination with language? I mean, you're also, you, you, you speak and you use Japanese words and, and Spanish words as well. Why this fascination with language? Well, it's a code that we use that's very inadequate often for what we're trying to do. And I was just remembering in that dream section in the, in the there's this, in Home of the Brave, I'm, I forget which song it is, but anyway, it's like, going on about a, a dream and it's just mm -hmm. getting more and more ridiculous. And then I realize, oh, I can see the person writing the dream. And then I just, uh, uh, and then that person is spinning some more and I just go, give me that pen, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, cause you can, uh, I think you can rewrite. Language is powerful um, and, and predictive so that you can also, uh, if you can shape it in another way, that's the that's your reality. We just went through and are still in a war that is about reality in the United States. What's real? What's fake? Um, you'd think that that was you know. Remember the culture wars? And there, mm -hmm. it was like I like this and you like that, but it became a sort of like a war. And you'd think that could never become a real war. Well, we just saw how that ha could happen. The words can create a a war. It was Freud who said, you know, uh, civilization began when uh, somebody, the first person threw, threw out a word instead of a rock. Um, that uh, is um, what we just saw is that, you know, the words can also um, start a a war. Oh, I'd call this a war. That because um, because things look very war torn mm -hmm. now. You know, um, you walk around New York and things have uh, things are still so shuttered and and dark. And uh, all our cultural institutions are closed except for museums um, and places we would meet are closed. It looks like there was a war mm -hmm. and. Um, people are sick and a lot of people are dead. It looks like a war. And um, of course, people don't call it a war because our state is more just a war that's, you don't even mention it. It's always in the background. Uh, we used to declare war, have an enemy, have, you know, coherent story war. Now just war is just happening all the time. And so it, it fails to be a very useful metaphor, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. Susan Sontag used it all the time uh, as a metaphor, and now it, it's it's just the ground of our life. So anyway, um, language is a virus. I wrote for Burroughs because he said that was a quote that he said language is a virus from outer space. And I was like, whoa, what does that mean for a writer to say language is a disease communicable by mouth? very weird thing to say. And then I, in thinking about it later in other contexts, especially now, uh, you realize that it's a very hard code to crack. Um, and when people start using it more as tweets and slogans and, mm. and you, it's very hard to crack that code and get back to a, a different kind of thinking. And um, it's why, why poets like Jack Kerouac are so su successful? I think one reason, because his name rhymed, Jack Kerouac. It's fun to say, <laughs> Jack. And the way Jack Kerouac said that, I, I remember Jack Kerouac. Anyway, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can all of these little little language things that Burroughs knew very well how to use uh, were, were part of that idea that is, that language is a virus. And of course, then we we can see that it is and it has become a Burroughs world. Language is completely viral and <clears throat> and works that way, and and gets into your mind that way. And of course, now we realize also that virus is a language. And one of the reasons we're in this situation is that's a code that's very, very hard to crack. And its variants are coming up, and those are even harder to crack. So we are stuck in this uh, um, loop-like situation of of um, of, uh, of trying to catch up with the code. So I, I guess that <clears throat> I mean codes are are really interesting to me. I, I've tried to design a few different kinds of languages and they're, some of them are, are written uh, graphic things and some of them are um, ways that you can uh, use um, uh, new merges. Uh, let me see if I, I could maybe f do this. I wonder if I can do this. That's a different command, hang on. So, for example, what I'm saying to you now was something that my dictionary recommended. And the cadence and beats of what I'm saying are represented in this way as cadence and beats as cadence. <laughs> 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 So that when you can make various hybrids with um, uh, language systems, uh, it, it's um, it reminds you that you you have no idea who's talking. Mm. You know, what what are you parroting right now? You know, things you've heard and things you think I think you you should say, or you know, I don't, you know, wh where language comes from is is um, is so mysterious. And so that's why uh, once in a while um, um, using silence in, in the middle of some of those situations is, um, can, be very, can be very revealing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go also just back to the song Language is a Virus too, mm -hmm. because that's, it's such a funky song. It reminds me a lot of uh, Bill Laswell's material, that kind of angry I funk. Love that's Bill. At, yeah, fantastic, fantastic work he did and still does. Um, but it was produced, co-produced, I should say, by Nile Rogers, formerly of Chic. He had just finished producing David Bowie's album, Let's Dance. He had just produced also Madonna's Like a Virgin. How did he come about to work with Nile Nile Rogers on both Smoke Rings and Language as a Virus? I think it was because I was talking to Roma about that last night, how that happened. And I think it was just we were hanging around the same studios and everybody's record was happening sort of at the same time often and and <clears throat> the studios were very busy and so you would you'd see a bass player over there and he just finished a session you like can you play in my thing and uh i think that's how i met bill and that's probably how i met niall mm -hmm. um in we were, we were studio rats you know we just spent all our time in the studio this is one of the things that i that the one of the great technological innovations that's wiped out a lot of of camaraderie with musicians is the studio scene doesn't exist. Mm, yeah, Everyone's yeah. just in their home studio doing it and it gets very solipsistic. It's, it's, um, it, w it was a lot of fun to go to studios and mm -hmm. be part of this big network of music. So that, that was how and why that happened. Well, it's interesting because you started off as you know, more of an avant-garde, you know, sculptor or performer in, in the 1970s. And then you recorded this song, Oh, Superman, and it was on a, a, an independent label. And it actually reached number two here in the UK. Yeah. And that helped, I believe, you get your deal with Warner Brothers, which you did. You did many albums uh, throughout the 1980s. Well, you know, Warner Brothers was coming to my shows. So, or a couple of years before that. And they would say, do you want to make a record? And I was like, no way. I, I'm not a pop artist. I have no interest in that. I, I really don't want to make a record. And they were like, no, you could make an interesting record. It was Karen Berg and Bob Gear would come to my shows. 
And uh, and then what happened was I put this song out uh, on a um, little label, and when people would order it, I would just get the order usually by the phone, and then I'd wrap up the record, I'd take it down the street to the post office, and I'd send it to that person. <laughs> so then I got a call from, um, oh, what's his name? A wonderful British, um, he had such a great radio show. John um, Peel? John Peel. So I got a call from John Peel, and he said, I'd like to order some of your records. And I said, great, how many would you like? He said, 20,000 now and 20,000 by Friday. I was like, okay. So then I did call Warner Brothers. I said, listen, can you, can you press some records for me? I've got, I've got a big order here. And they were like, that is not the way we do things at Warner Brothers Records and Tapes. You sign an eight record deal where we own everything, but the rest of you are like, sound good? I was like, God, that sounds awful. You know, but <laughs> the thing about it was that um, I did like the idea that people could get uh, artwork for, for cheap because right at that moment, those two moments collided when the New York art world, it was exploding mm -hmm. and it was becoming uh, all about money. And that was just the beginning. And I mean, now it's like completely about money. You know, you're not part of the art world. You're part of the art market. It's a market. Yeah. It's it's huge, and so is the record business too. It's it's a, and so is the concert business. It's a, it's very. Um, and I'm such a snob, you know. I I just wish it was, a a niche thing again, you know. It was like, so I have very mixed feelings about that. But it was fun. I, anyway, I called them up and they said, okay, we we came to some terms, and uh, but it wasn't like, you know, this record was was. Uh, it, I was resisting that move, mm -hmm. and then, and and I, but I was glad I did that. It gave me a lot of opportunities to do things. I never took this seriously for one second. Maybe for a second I did, you know. I got seduced by this thing, but I approached it. I think a little bit like an anthropologist. Um, just this is so absurd that people are surrounding this car, banging on the windows, going, "Lori!" I was like, "What are you?" You're, you're out of your minds. You know, this, this is so stupid. <laughs> but did you also like the the appeal of having a broader audience and the accessibility of the pop music format and, and maybe the almost like the immediacy as well of pop music? Well, I like, I, I, like I said, I was seduced by part of it for sure. And it did give me chances to do things. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not sneezing at that. It was really, it was really fun to do. And, and, um, but it, it's also very easy to get carried away with, you know, your own self-importance. So uh, I didn't want to be, I guess I was afraid how disappointed I would be, you know, uh, it just comes and goes, you know, it's like, yeah. so I, I decided I'm going to be very philosophical about this. I'm not going to get sucked in. And um, the people at Warner Brothers, however, would really like, um, they want, uh, they, they decided, okay, after that record, Big Science, we're, we need another hit. So they would, for a while, they would come to the studio and sit in the back. And usually people from record companies, they don't know what to say, you know. They, so they, their default is, I think this needs more bass. <laughs> and, and everyone's like, well, are you getting more bass? Okay, they, they, the record company talking. and and uh, But there wasn't much base at all on what I was doing. There was a lot of things like birds and stuff, but I'm sure that they would not sit in the back of the studio going, I think it needs, I don't know, more birds. <laughs> you know. Put a bird on it, as they say in yeah, Portlandia. Yeah. Bird on there. <laughs> so, so, but I mean, I had, uh, I had a lot of friends at Warner Brothers. They, they, I, they were, they were just a great company for, um, for musicians. And now was the time that was a very, I was so lucky to be part of that era of singer songwriters who uh, had, uh, could suddenly write their own things, put it out mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and make a living doing that for it, that is gone for now. So that it, it's um, thanks again to uh, largely to technological innovations in which uh, 
musicians uh, lost the ability to control mm. uh, their uh, their own market. So they couldn't make a, you can't make a living from records. Maybe three people do now or something, but then you could. And um, so it became about touring. And then, uh, and then other uh, elements came into to that to try to make touring a really big blockbuster thing. So, and combined with what's happening now with a lot of um, smaller venues closing because of COVID, uh, I hope they can come back. Yeah. It's those things that, that will suffer. The little venues, the clubs, the scenes, Places where you can do live music, and if you're a young musician, you can check, try things out. Those are so important. They're so important. And New York has had uh, a dwindling number, but the, we're trying to hold on to the ones that we have now. We still have some venues, and, and hope that those come back because they are where musicians figure out what to do, how to do it, and um, uh, and without that. Um, there's there's not a way you know i guess a few people are are doing their podcasts and stuff and yeah. and and that's it well, and some of them are pretty good you well, know music is so is so important to so many people and i i, I don't yeah. know if you feel the same way both as someone who creates music but also somebody who listens to music and and you you create in so many different disciplines a myriad of different disciplines but do you feel that music might have a stronger emotional resonance in terms of it just gets right into those emotions a lot quicker than some of the other mediums in which you work? Um, yes, in certain ways, because um, it's uh, things that come through your ears are uh, you have a very different relationship to them. and. Um, music makes you want to get up and dance sometimes, even though the dance is some kind of other trance dance of, uh, you know, where you're listening to William Bozinski. Uh, it's physical. It's the body. This is what a big thing that I learned from Lou is how do you know when something's good? Okay. He always had a way. It was his arm. He would show you his arm. He would say, see that? See that? See that? And it was all the hairs were sticking up going like this. And he said, it's good. I was like, okay. The body will tell you, and especially with music, it gets into your, um, it, you, it can make your heart rate go up, it can make you cry very easily, and it can make you laugh. Uh, I see very few people in museums standing in front of a beautiful, their beautiful favorite painting, crying. It, play them their favorite song, and they'll be sobbing. It just comes into your body and mind in a different way. I'm not saying better or worse. I mean, visual art that is beautiful, it comes into your brain and mixes with other visual images. It sticks there. It's some, some kind of thing you could never forget. It is, um, uh, uh, but your mind is gliding past it in different ways. It's, it, it's kind of a little bit analyzing it. Um, so what I'm just saying, I guess in some ways is that, that hearing is, inherently more more overtly emotional than seeing seeing is analytic and uh and your mind approaches what it sees in a very different way mm. and sometimes a little bit more skeptically you know um and worried that it can be fooled by what it's seeing like that's just uh it's, it's worried sometimes <laughs> and and your ears are just Bring it on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no filters. Yeah, yeah. And you can't close your ears. <laughs> you can plug them up, but you can't close your ears. Like you can close exactly. your eyes. I mean, this album, a lot of the music is quite physical. And I'm not sure if it's just because I'm also imagining the concert performance. You move so wonderfully in, in the Home of the Brave uh, concert movie. It is, the whole choreography is fantastic. But this also brings me to another topic I'd like to talk about, and that's the technology and your sense of inventiveness uh, within the actual instruments. And uh, on one part in the in the movie, you have a suit. Uh, you're doing body percussion. Oh, you must can have. I back to, can I go back to one thing for a second? Sure. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something. We'll get to the drum suit in a second, but um, okay. The uh, 
what was going on with choreography in Home of the Brave was not choreography, it was conducting. Because in Smoke Rings, nobody could count the, the song. It's tum, chum, da ka tu ku ta, ku ka ka ku. So I invented a conducting thing that's boom, ba, ba, boom, da ka tu ku ta. So this is what I'm doing there is showing them where the downbeat is. And Dolette and Janice were always like, where's the downbeat? I was like, forget downbeat. Jesus, they're all downbeats. Think of them all as downbeats, you know, and and here's how it goes. So you hit your heart and you you and you do this conduct. So that was what I was doing with the violin and the and the kicks and the showing them how that phrase, because it was a loop like phrase that they needed to know the shape of. So I would just show them the shape as it was kind of it was a diagram of the shape of the of the beats. So it wasn't choreography, it was, it was something different. With drum suit, um, and drum dance was a, uh, I guess also had to do with um, uh, the body and beats, of course, but it was, um, I was taking apart a Lindrum machine and um, I just got some new tiny drum machines uh, now, uh, pocket operators are, oops, pocket operators, green screen, pocket operators are tiny now. They uh, uh, are just uh, circuit boards, really. And uh, you can, if you have super tiny fingers, you can uh, program your song on this tiny little thing. Uh, and uh, Actually, it's not that much tinier than a Lindrum machine once you take the box off, because with the Lindrum, I was like, okay, I, I want to, I needed to fix it. It was broken. So I was, I mean, I have like zero fix it skills, but I thought maybe <laughs> something easy in there and took it apart. And uh, the cables were very, very long, you know, they, and, and at the end was a sensor. I thought, why are they so long? They don't need to be so long. Nice. So I thought, if I put this one uh, on my shoulder and this one over my bass drum thing over my heart and the on my knee, I put the a kick, uh, I'll do a, uh, a bass, bass clap, you know, uh, um, body dance. So uh, anyway, the, uh, the body and how it, uh, worked was was my uh, one of my um, it, was, it was my material. So uh, as somebody who stands on a stage, I wasn't somebody who was just in the studio doing things and issuing them. I was putting them out and 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 being part of them. Uh, so uh, the drum dance was um, uh, was like that. I mean, it, it's in, I just love how you've been so inventive with instrumentation. You invented the tape bow violin in, in 1977. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that was a, a kind of language machine initially. Um, and it was also a, a result of, of editing. So with tape heads, so for example, I'd be playing the violin and um, and then stop the tape machine because I'm engineering myself and then I'd rock it back and forth to get to the start point again and edit point and then I'd play again. So playing, rocking, playing, rocking, suddenly that's the same gesture 
tape over her head going back and forth over her head. Why not just put it right on the bow? So I read it, read it, read it. So I put a, pulled the record, a playback head off a otherwise perfectly good Revox tape machine and put it on the, um, put it on the bridge of a violin, like, like there. Mm -hmm. And then the, the tape bow goes over that head and and suddenly you have um you know audio palindromes god is always dog backwards in spelling the world of letters <laughs> yeah. but if you say god oh you know backwards language spoken is um totally unpredictable so i just try to find words that would sound make sense backwards so no is one no one no one say Weirdly is yes, say yes, say yes, say yes. So unpredictable. Mean is name. So I had one song that was say what you mean and mean what you say and say yes, say yes, and no one, no one, no one. I know what you mean, name, name, mean, you know. So anyway, um, super geeky. And we did a, a orchestra with this. And they, I can't tell you how disgusted the orchestra players were when they saw that they had to play these in instruments. They were like... <laughs> I'm not going to play this gimmicky, stupid thing. I'm a, I'm a cellist. I mean, I, you know, and then I said, I know, I know, I know it's geeky, but just try it because it's really hard to control. I mean, for, for string players, you know, um, chops, is, chops are their left hand, you know, fast, fast. The bow is the expressive, the beautiful, so, you know, how you shape the set, the note and where it blooms and where it cracks. I mean, that is all in the touch of the bow. So I said, you know, you are studied expression in your right hand. And that's what this is. You're not just a, a Revox tape machine. You have control of your right hand. And, and just look at the, here's a random person tried playing this and they can't play it. And then, but string players, picked it up and they knew how to do it. And I said, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, you're the people who can play this. So, so then they kind of like swallowed their like hesitation. <laughs> Some of them were still like, I'm not playing this stuff, no way. And they just sit there like, it's, I, so they hang it. <laughs> but it's not, it's more than a novelty or a gimmick. I think, I think you're using these sounds and these, this, these instrumentation and, and playing around with language to really reinforce the story that you're trying to get across. Yeah, I mean, but when you're a string player, that's not how you see it. In an orchestra, <laughs> that is not how you see it. <laughs> Got you. Fortunately, there's a lot of different kinds of people in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the sequence of the album, I love getting into sequencing of the album. You start with smoke rings and then it ends with credit racket. Um, it was there a, a, a kind of uh, idea behind the sequencing? Was there a way that you wanted the album to flow from beginning to end? You know, we did end with uh, credit racket, which was something that we, a vamp that we did uh, in the film with the film um, band, let's say. And I thought, oh, I really want to put this out of this record. It's just wild and, and fun. And and for me, there's no no more fun than getting a really big band of like disparate but related people mm -hmm. to to vamp. And the last time I did that was oh summer before last. We had a, a second annual Lou Reed Tai Chi Day, and we celebrated with a, a big band of people who were playing all sorts of things. So, so there was John Zorn and Hal Wilner, oh, um, yeah. who um, I, I I have to say, I, one of the greatest producers of the world uh, and a great friend of Lou's and great friend of mine who died of COVID last year, mm -hmm. um, almost a year ago now, it seems like completely impossible. You know, some people are so vivid. Uh, Hal was a just a genius um, producer, uh, and also a wonderful live player. Just who had zero rules. So, <laughs> in Credit Racket, we tried to do that, do that things in that spirit that would just like be wow, you know. And so we thought, let's let's end end with the party. Why not? And the beginning was um, a kind of hello song in a way, and a uh, um, starting with a game show. I thought at that. At that time in, in 
was, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I thought that was a good idea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, a, we have some questions that people uh, emailed us and one oh, okay. person had a question about Credit Racket and I also have a question about Credit Racket too. So I'll, I'll ask both in the same, in the same question. Uh, Bill Laswell is in is uh, listed as playing base animals, which I need to ask you exactly <laughs> what is base animals. And we also had a question from Dum Dum Boy. He went by Dum Dum Boy name. He asked about uh, Adrian Belus playing what it was like working with him oh. uh, on guitar. Uh, he plays a lot of great guitar on that record on that song. Yeah. Oh yeah, he does. So um, uh, both. Uh, Bill Laswell and Adrian Ballou are animals for sure. <laughs> they're they're like they're music animals. They are just you know so, and I say that in the, the most respectful way possible. They're intuitive. They're fierce. They're right in your face. They're they're one hundred percent both of them, and and they're both the greatest people to play with. So because of because of that, and 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 strangely many of the sounds that they were making or and especially the ones that I gravitated to the most had to do with with things I love most about music the wails of sound ah, you know that Adrian is somewhere between a saxophone and a guitar he's you know it's you, you think, what instrument is he playing I mean because the and 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 between a shriek you know and a siren mm. uh, it's and build the same. I mean, to get this grittiness into a sound is no, uh, it, it is a trick. You know, it's it's really not easy to do to get it to be so visceral. And I, I guess that's what I mean by um, uh, animals and animal sounds. And I, I think that's what what Bill meant by that as well. You know, base animal. That's like it's just an animal. Is ah, <laughs> there were also lots of sounds that were rumbles in there though the main sound that i heard was NECAM. NECAM was a a program a mixing program computer program that we used and every time we shut down for the day in the studio you'd hear this Whoa! and i thought that's the most beautiful sound on the record and it's shutting down for the day so we i i leanne unger was the engineer and I said, Leanne, we've got to record the knee cam crashing. Oh, and it made an even better sound when it crashed and it was always crashing. It was always crashing. Home of the Brave was about the computer crashing in the mix. So uh, the knee cam, <laughs> that's all over the record. It is, that yeah. is the sound of radar. So mm -hmm. it's like also technology crashing and it's in, uh, it's in smoke rings. It's the, in, it's the featured instrument of the tag of smoke rings. It's also in I think I put it everywhere I could because I just loved this big animal techno sigh of just, oh, you know, of stopping. I love that sound. I was one, I was gonna, going to ask you about that sound, actually. I'm glad, I'm glad you spoke about it. Um, in fact, also a couple things. Another uh, person emailed in, Herbie King, and he says, is Laurie Anderson aware of how her music really impacted the UK rave scene and also the scene in Ibiza? I'm not sure if, if this is on your <laughs> radar, but you know, White Lily and and Radar were both on uh, Cafe Del Mar mixtapes done by Jose Padilla, nice. and and O oh Superman, you know, is is very inspirational to the UK rave scene. In fact, uh, there's even been a new remake of it by Book of Shade versus Mandy, which you may sure. or may not be aware about. I don't know. I don't know if I'm uh, oh, getting in trouble it. there. Go for it. It's fine with me. Okay, cool. But were, were you aware <laughs> about how impactful this was over here in the UK to different scenes that are outside of what might normally be considered experimental or avant-garde? That's cool. I no, I, I wasn't really. And so thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. It's really interesting <laughs> because, you know, you can sit like me, like a lot of musicians, uh, we're sitting around um, trying to make things and, and, um, you know, especially when you're in an isolated situation, like making a record. And now when you're in an isolated situation, like COVID, you're making stuff and you're thinking, no one's ever going to hear this. It's just weird. So, uh, it can be very isolating. Uh, so, uh, especially without any touring or live things, it's just quite weird. Mm -hmm. So to hear that somebody else heard it and 
and thought about it is just really wonderful. It's very touching. So thanks for saying that. Oh, well, I just want to ask you a couple of final questions before we ask people to listen to the album themselves at home. <laughs> you recently listened to the album and you hadn't listened to it, I'm sure, in, in decades. Yeah. How did you feel about it today? I loved it. I, oh, I mean, good. frankly, I was dreading this like, because <laughs> I never, ever, ever listened to things that I've done after the final mix. And, and well, actually, I listened in the days of refs. I, I did listen to it. Um, had to and, and it was technical listening of course so um it was uh and you're listening in from many different ways uh i also just realized in in working on a, a record with called document two with brian eno in denmark we made this uh we made it in 2016 and it came out i think a couple of years ago but we would play all morning four hours we take a lunch break and then we would sit down and in real time listen to the four hours. I have never done that in my life. And I realized I don't know how to play and listen simultaneously. Mm. Uh, listening is a, a real skill. And, and I, I think when you listen a hundred percent and I, I'm glad that you said, try to listen uh, with, you know, turn the lights out and actually focus on it. I, I did do that. Uh, uh, and it was, um, uh, I, I had a very good time. Like I said, I was just dreading. I thought, oh, this is going to be so out of date, coy, snarky. I remember, you know, I bet the irony is really stupid. I, you know, I'm, this is going to be torture. And I, I had put it off for quite a while. <laughs> and I listened to it. And I was like, you know, number one, great bass sound. Mm. Boom you know, really good sound uh, and, and nice, nice perspective of things. I feel like a, I'm reviewing the record of, 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 the, of somebody else, you know? <laughs> but I did enjoy it. And, and I did, um, I did like, uh, uh, um, I did like the end of smoke ring still a lot uh, with the knee cam thing. And I remember playing with that and I, had, I was playing a synth violin, which was a, um, thing I designed with Max Matthews. That was a different violin, not the tempo, but it was connected to the synclavier, which I was wedded to. And many of those synclavier sounds are all through the record. I was like, um, I used to, it, it was a big, big synthesizer with sampling. So a lot of the sampling that you hear on the record was not tapo, it was synclavier sampling. Mm. So it was not tape, it was computer looping. Yeah. So it was, um, I, it was an era when you would buy a synthesizer for an enormous amount of money and then they would just send you boxes and they, you were you were called dear synclavier owner here's a box of an uh, updates and then we know you'll want please send us forty thousand dollars and you're like at that point <laughs> this is like this, you know like you could buy three houses for that and you're like the, this a little update that got rid of a few of their problems so so i was a synclavier owner, not user, not musician, Sinclair owner, dear Sinclair owner. So, um, uh, the, anyway, a lot of those sounds were, were, uh, made that way. So computers were very, were, were, were really integrated into, into what this record was about as were visuals. So, uh, but listening to it, um, I, I did, I did fall into that feeling. And also I remember in playing uh, that violin, boom, and I had a knee cam on the synthesizer violin. So I was playing a breaking computer and, uh, and I, felt, I felt like it, you know, I, I, I go for these moments uh, where music just, you know, carries you away in a huge, um, wave and you kind of, you know, live for those moments. It could be a small wave too. It can be something just so beautiful and delicate, like some little piano part. It doesn't have to be big, but anyway, um, to be carried away. Yeah. Well, I think we're all ready to jump on that wave now, Lori. <laughs> Thank you so much for well, joining us today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Colleen. I, I really enjoyed all your, your questions and comments. It, made me, it really brought me back into a world I, I just left long ago.
Oh, lovely. Well, thank you. And thank you to the British Library staff for allowing this, this event stream to happen. And thanks to all of you for, for watching and listening. And I want to encourage you to take a moment to yourself <laughs> and to listen to the entire album, to the entire Home of the Brave soundtrack on whatever format you have. I have a record. <laughs> and use our Classic Album Sunday's listening guidelines, which means turn off your phone. You'll be glad you did. It's a good thing for you. <laughs> turn down the lights. Refrain from conversation. Do not talk. It's hard to listen while you're talking. Turn up the volume. Kick back and give yourself over to the music. Thanks for listening. <laughs>